Joel. Joel's a good guy. I'm gonna just start recording. Now everybody wants to know which Joel you're talking about. You were just saying what a what a dickhead he is. Billy Joel. Billy Joel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Are you really live? Oh my god. Are you live? Yeah, we're live as shit, man. Welcome to the Practical Pistol Show. My name's Ben here to answer your shooting questions. On deck today, what? No, go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Matt Hopkins. <laughs> Say hello, Matthew. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hansik. Hello. Hello. <laughs> What the fuck? Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. <laughs> <laughs> is it? No, hold on, I'll be right back. What? It's really live. And Mr. Tim Heron. Say hi, Tim. Hey, guys. What's up? <laughs> oh, man. All right. Oh, there's Hopkins. I feel like this was not, a, not our strongest start to a podcast ever. Probably not. That's okay. It's perfectly fine. I'm happy to report that we've set the bar real low. Mm -hmm. So, that's good. Uh, first, I would like to thank you and the other gentleman, I think he means you, Hansik, for having a podcast. I'm new to USPSA and I enjoy your content. Fork in the road, gear, queer, question. I want to reach master class in production within the next three years. Follow the Dry Fire Regiment, laid out your book, Dry Fire, and Live Fire once a week. I'm progressing. However, before my time with the pistol really starts accumulating, I was wondering if I should switch to something that fits my hand better. I currently use the CZ P09. I chose it because it was inexpensive and easily compatible with my P07 carry gun. Hoppy, is the P09 any good? Be yeah, honest. Good. Be good. honest, dude. It's good. Fucking liar. You're such a corporate shell. <laughs> Whatever, dude. That's the plastic one, right? That's a plastic one. You told like me plastic fired. guns are for idiots. Double single action. And that real it's got, the Omega, it's shoot, got the Omega trigger in it, right? said real men shoot metal guns and big heavy metal guns, especially especially stock twos. Is what you said, Matt. I don't recall Shadow those two. comments. Oh, yeah, Shadow, Shadow two. two. That's the one. Shadow twos is right, though. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like the trigger and the frame's point of aim, but the grip is too thin. I use the, uh, all right, anyway. makes it harder to really squeeze on the gun with my left hand. If I could add the grip with using extra tape or JB weld, I would be happy with the gun. I wouldn't consider changing it. However, from my understanding, the production rules, this would be illegal. Um, yeah, that one doesn't have grip panels, Matt. It's just a nope. plastic frame. Just plastic frame. Yeah, so he can that's do. Why, that's why it's cheap. Yeah, you're right. So is it worth investing in a stock to or whatever larger from gun right now so that I accumulate the training hours with the, the gun better fit to my hand or should I just keep chugging with the PO9 and change once I have a bit more matches under my belt? Thanks for your help. Hansik, what's the right answer? The, <laughs> the, the right answer is grip harder. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so I've got pretty big hands. I'm 6'3". Six, uh, six the tallest Korean ever. So I shot CZ, Genfolio. I'm currently shooting Walther. So I've experienced small grips, thin grips, fat grips, big grips, every grips. So Man, you whore. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, I kind of came down to the conclusion that it's really, uh, if I find the correct grip for the specific grip panel, so most of every single time I moved to the other platform, other gun, I had to somehow change my weight, the way to grip it in order to make the friction part really efficient and the leverage part of the grip efficient as well. So I think if, if the grip size of your gun is within reason, I think there is no reason to change. I think if you feel like your grip is not really proper with the current gun, I think try different grip methods. Uh, try gripping with the what left hand index finger on the trigger guard kind of technique. All kinds of things. Uh, 
and also that's how I found my grip um, by trying a lot of different grip techniques, grip methods, and all that. So I, I really don't think if you ha if your hand size is somewhere around average or big, I don't think he really has to change his gun. I think he just has to experiment a little bit and then find the right grip. Okay, so you say keep that gun. Yeah, keep that gun. Hmm. All right, Hopkins. But shoot more. Hopkins, you say buy a shadow too, right? <laughs> oh, it's even better than that gun, dude. He's going to have problems with well, that Well, he too. can buy different grip panels, right? You could put stock two grip panels on it, right? Hey, I guess you could get different grip panels, but still, it's thin. What do you mean you guess? That's like a normal, that's like one of the you features. You can, yes, you can, yes. <laughs> Fucking dickhead. <laughs> Tim, what do you say? Um, I mean, if, he's, if his goal is to make master in three years, which is not unheard of, there's lots of guys that have done that. Um, I know, I know to, this Korean dude that did it. And I yeah, think I know. Time. Yeah. So I'm going to do the same. I would suggest the same thing as Quanzik and recommend that he just stay with the gun he's got and just put in the work. And I say, fuck all you guys get the new gun. <laughs> no, seriously. He's decided he doesn't dig the gun. Fuck that gun, then. Get a different gun. Like, get get the gun that you want. You know what I mean? This is coming for me. Like the dot. I. It, it mean the writing's on the wall. He doesn't like the gun, and he's already going to get a different gun. So it's like, should you shoot the gun you don't like and get a get the new gun later, or get the new gun now and shoot the gun that you actually want? But is he just going through a, a you know, Doesn't just matter. a series of he's selection of choices where he's like, yep, I want this new gun. Well, what if he gets a new gun and he he's realizes already, he, he already shoots it worse than he does the old gun? He's already not into his, his, his gun. It's too late. It's over. Just get a P320X5 and call it a day. You can get whatever he wants, but, like, he's decided he's changing, so just change now. See what I mean? Shoot single stack. It's no better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Man, a man on island just say, yeah, if you're gonna change guns, change guns now. Don't 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 put off. Same thing that Hopkins did. When he was changing the shadow too, he just changed and he, he sucked it up and shot limb ten. That's how committed he was. That's right. So, so would you know the change is coming, just you just roll with it, dude. It's okay. Yeah, that's what I did. Honestly, I knew I'd be shooting it this year at the end of the year or middle to the end of the year. Right. So I just shot it. I did the same thing. Like when I when I got a stock two, it was like the timing was inconvenient, and it's like I think I had a week before an area match to, yeah, to learn yeah, that gun. A week before an area I had match. it a week, and it's yep. like, well, this is the gun I'm going to be shooting. Well, fuck it, I'll just shoot this gun. Like the timing <laughs> wasn't great, but uh, whatever. It worked out okay. Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Let's go to the next question. Is it ever acceptable to watch Popper start to fall before you leave a position as opposed to calling the shot good and just leaving the position in hopes that the Popper falls? Definitely more risky if the Popper activates something and you'd have to go back. I've been Popper fucked a few times this summer and I always lose count. No, dude, Popper fucking's not real. Even if <laughs> the first hit was in the center of the circle. Nah, whatever. What do, you, what do you think, Hopkins? Is it acceptable to wait for the Popper to, to fall? No, you should be calling your shot and getting the fuck out of there. I mean, like, is that like hard and fast? No exceptions? Well, I mean, just fire an extra if you're worried about it. Double up on it, right? That's I don't your mantra. I'm asking you, man. Yeah, I mean, if it's worth shooting once, it's probably worth shooting twice, would be what they'd See? say, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Accuracy by volume? That's another Ben, isn't well, it? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think you should watch it fall, no. I think you should, like, in you know, worst case, like, see the hit on it, maybe. Like, I can't even say that, though. Like, that's, that's still. All right. Hansik, what do you think? Yeah, so I I kind of watch it. I, I shouldn't say fall, but... 
I I watch it, or sometimes I confirm the hit if it's like 25 yard mini popper. So, and also let's say that 25 yard mini popper was the last target of the ray before I move out. Okay, if I I had so many of the flinching, oh, did I hit it? And then I was moving out, but I saw it didn't go down and come back to the position and make uh, make a makeup shot. Beginning of my shooting career, I did that so many times. And right now, if I'm shooting really, really difficult popper, like 25-yard mini popper, I wouldn't just call the shot and move out. I would call the shot, and maybe if I give a realistic number, I may pause for like, 0.2 seconds or 0.3 seconds to actually confirm and hear the tingling ting sound the steel sound and also like make sure the hit was hit not edge hit or something like that that makes sense but then if this guy is talking about really big popper at seven yard kind of thing then what i would do uh, is i would first um, do some research if that popper was you know other people had a struggle or if that popper was forward falling kind of things i would gather a little bit of information if that popper was a little loose popper or somebody had a problem with it then i would purposefully hit the center of the circle calibration zone so i wouldn't just go hose at it and just hear the thing or uh make sure i'm shooting anywhere on the popper i wouldn't do that i would not shoot that on the low part of the calibration zone, but I would purposefully aim at the upper part of the circle or even the head of the popper. But I don't watch it fall in the easy popper scenario. That's a waste of time. Tim Aaron. Yeah, Tim Aaron, start talking. Um, I don't know. I, I think if it's, a, if it's an activator that activates a swinger that you can't get from, you know, that same position or it's it's going to be a, a a hell of a movement from where you activate it you know with the popper to uh you know to a position 15 feet over or 20 feet over um i i see less detriment to actually confirming that the popper is hit and falling than you know the the level of uh of degradation to your stage by having to, you know, getting to the next position, expecting a swinger to be there and it not be there. And, you know, either accepting a, a, a mic and a failure to engage or something like, you know, something like that versus having to then go back and hit the popper again. So I think it's, it, I think it is a little scenario dependent, but, uh, 99% of the time. No, I, I would agree with, with Matt. It don't, you, you know, confirm it by a good shot call and get the hell on Tim, you're talking sense, dude. I'm serious. Well, thank you. Matt, you're definitely right about best practice is call your shot and move. But, I mean, at some point, I mean, how far away, Matt, do they have to put the goddamn popper before you're, you'd you stop uh, sticking to that every time? What if they put it at know. 50 yards? You just well, fire one? Probably just fire a shot and go on, man. <laughs> right. Like, I'm not even going to move the gun off the popper until I've heard and confirmed a hit on the popper at a 50 yards. Yeah, just but, because even moving the gun off the popper and having to come back and hit it again, you're taking up more time than you would have just sitting there and confirming that the popper was hit and falling before you moved. So yeah. you're doing follow-through. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, they get so difficult. That, I mean, we're, I mean once, once you get to the point where you aren't really sure of what you're seeing mm -hmm. and not, not everybody gets to the limits of what their marksmanship ability is when they're going fast, whether that's 10 yards or 30 yards for you, it doesn't really matter. It's like you, when you get to the point where it's like your sights look, look good to you, but that may not be enough, you know, like you just get to the edge of what you can do. Then yeah, I mean, you're going to have to make sure, you hit the popper. That's what I think, anyway. Especially if it activates something. That's fucking crazy to move on, like, without making sure the thing's down. And I, I think one way you can work around this is with your order. You know? So if right. you have that sort of scenario, even though you may not otherwise do it, it might be like, 
shoot long popper, then shoot some close stuff. And then you're going to look up and check the popper again as, as you're getting out of the position, make sure it's down. You could do that sort of stuff, try to work right. around it. But you know, I mean, when they get really tough, like you got to make sure of what you're seeing and make sure that the, the popper is going to go down. <sighs> yeah. Let's do one more, I think. Okay. I think you have to call your shots and trust it, man. Like if a thing's out of calibration, you're probably going to get fucked over anyway. You can't just fire a bunch of rounds at it. Well, you want to trust what you're seeing, but, uh, I mean, this is not something you do that often. I could think of, I mean, when we went to the Europeans, remember there was one stage that had like a 35 yard popper. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I was like, fuck that. I wasn't like going to fire a shot at it and take off. You know, it was like aim at it hard, fire a shot looks good. Like see the bullet impact on the popper, hear it. And it's like, okay, now I'll go. And even then, it's a couple seconds before it falls. Well, you can't wait till it falls. I mean, I did confirm like I did. I confirmed I hit it. Like, yeah, I have enough that I can, you know, have a pretty epic internet tirade if it doesn't fall. So that's good. <laughs> you should shoot major, dude. <laughs> I should shoot. I should like take one nine major round and like load it in the magazine for when I get to that popper. <laughs> it's probably yeah. There good. you go. Get some of that World War II German like steel core shit and fire that at the popper. See what happens. <laughs> probably just bore a hole through it and stand up. <laughs> yeah. Probably would. I'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> damn it. Thought I got it. All right. I'm getting started with your newest book, Dry Fire Reloaded. In the back, we describe different shooters and then suggest a training plan for them. I would fall into the stuck in B class for two years. Every You guys all know somebody who's been stuck in B class for a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. That you yeah. Are, you're stuck in B class, Tom? I was. Okay. My question is, uh, what, what am I supposed to be doing in dry fire, and what would your suggestion for live fire practice be? Again, if I fall into the stuck in B, B class category. And then he's got a bunch of uh, nomenclature from the books, which uh, I'll, I'll get into. I guess if he wants, like what types of drills he'd be doing. But uh, uh, Matt, what would your recommendation be for a guy for his live and dry fire training if he's stuck in B class? To get out of it? No, to fucking stay in B class longer. <laughs> Don't shoot classifiers. <laughs> Don't shoot classifiers? Well, yeah, if he wants to stay in it, just don't shoot them. Fantastic. <laughs> Kim, what do you, you think? You didn't even read the question, did you? No, I just did. I just oh. read it. I think, uh, yeah, I, I was stuck in B class for a while compared to other classifications. Yeah, so not for two for me, years. Not for two years. For me cool. personally, like Matt said, uh, classifier skills, uh, he needs to have better skills. But then I think uh, he needs to break down those skill sets that you need to have to shoot the classifier really well. I think one of the biggest thing is basic, you know, gun handling stuff, uh, draw, reload, and gripping. So what I would suggest is in live fire, he should try the best to figure out the good grip uh, or other words, recoil management part. So he can split certain yards, like seven yards, 0.2 seconds split, in two, uh, for two alphas kind of thing so he has I think he should focus on recoil management on the live fire but in dry fire I would say the speed part the basic speed part he has to make so let's say the draw speed should be like a second draw then he should break down what it takes to have that one second draw skill so I would say one of them will be the reaction to the buzzer and the other one will be establishing the grip and presenting it to the target. So he has to break down those segments and develop those to have faster time and also consistent skill. Okay. So dry oh, fire. And he has yeah. to dry fire. He has to train. Uh, I, I personally think if he wants to get out of big class, I think 15 minutes per, per day maybe five days, six days a week is at least minimum. 
15 minutes, not too bad. Okay. I got an answer after everybody's done. Your, your mic volume is really sketchy, Matt. Like, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. Depends on where I'm sitting to the mic. I like that. That position's perfect. Okay, we'll try that. Okay. Mr. Tim. This guy, yeah, how's it going then? Uh, getting out of B class, I, I tend to see most guys just start to really get a skill set level that obviously gets them into B class pretty quickly. And I mean, it's one of those things I kind of tell everybody like B class is like the almost one of the easiest classes to break into, but it's almost the hardest class in all of USBSA to break out of. Um, a lot of it is you just start putting things together skill wise that, that, uh, you know, I've, I've different nomenclatures, you know, uh, different terminology, things like that start to make sense and start to, uh, you know, start to come to fruition for a shooter, but they just quite haven't learned how to, how to make it all work together consistently. Um, most guys that are stuck in B class for a long time tend to, tend to have an issue where they just can't quite get out of their own way. Um, they still try to force things to happen. They, they kind of still, they shoot reactively or, or more contrived versus just being able to kind of let go and shoot and being able to execute subconsciously. Um, and a lot of this because they don't know how to practice. They might go through the motions, but they don't really ever let themselves learn what it, to, you know, what it's like to make a mistake and learn from the mistake. You know, everything about practice tends to be, well, I did, you know, I was able to, to shoot, you know, a bill drill in 2.8 seconds all A's at seven yards, and that's good. But they've never pushed themselves to the point of failure or, or learn that it's okay in practice to push themselves to a point of failure to, to learn what it's like to even draw and run the gun six rounds, you know, consecutively in two seconds or less. You know, let alone trying to hit the target. Just learn what it's what it's like to feel that. So I think my biggest thing is, you know, for a guy that feels like they're like exponentially stuck in B class forever, is is you've got to learn and accept that it's okay to make mistakes in practice for the sake of learning from those mistakes to get better and learn what it takes to to put things together in a way that you can execute, you know, consistently. The consistency will come from learning from the mistakes that you're unwilling to allow yourself to make right now. Fire. Whether that be in dry fire or live fire. Well, that shit sounds pretty complicated. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll break down my take on this, or what I would say for most guys who I, I see stuck in B-class for two years. As you guys know, I meet a shitload of people. Like yep. a shitload. So uh, the most common scenario for stuck in B class is uh, it's people who kind of follow normal rules of marksmanship and shooting and get to that point and then have a hard time getting better. So what I mean is they can grip the gun properly or more or less properly. They can, you know, they, they can draw the gun, hold on to it, reload pre like not – Lays and fast, but they can reload the gun pretty quick. And then normally they could they put the sights on something, see a sight picture, can press the trigger. If they take their time, they can make the shots. Doesn't really matter what it is. Take their time, they can make it. And uh, if they go fast, I mean, if they start to shoot faster, then they won't really be comfortable. Um, but normally, if they just like see a sight picture, pull the trigger, they can hit stuff. That's what I norm normally see from B class guys. Um, which all sounds great, but then to get better than that, uh, to do better, you have to push and dry fire to draw the gun faster, reload faster, transition faster, whatever. Like they actually have to push beyond what they're comfortable with. And you can even, I even tell like getting the question from this guy, like he's very focused on what should I be doing? Cause he's willing to practice. He's like, what should I be doing and how much should I be doing it? And probably the, the more important thing is, like, what is the attitude you're going to bring to this? It's like, are you going to push hard? Or, like, if I give you the, a part time of draw the gun and point it at something in, like, seven-tenths of a second, are you going to be focused on the seven-tenths of a second part of that? Or are you just going to do a lot of repetition at, at the level you're at and, and try to hope that over time you're going to get faster? 
Does that mm-hmm. make sense, guys? So it's like you have to bring an attitude where you're actually going to push to get faster and get better and push right. hard and be okay making mistakes. And then as far as when you go to live fire, what Hansik's talking about is like working on uh, recoil control and that sort of stuff. That's a good way of putting it. The other, the other way I'd put it is like seeing a perfect side picture and pulling the trigger like that. That's going to make sure that you hit stuff. But uh, – to go beyond that, when you start shooting A class, M class, GM scores on things, you're going to have to learn to aim differently. Where it's like looking through your sights onto a target and seeing a blur of your fiber as you shoot, like as fast as you can pull the trigger on close targets. That's going to be something that you have to learn to get comfortable with because that's going to be how it goes down to get faster. You're not going to continue to repeat the same shit that you've been doing in B class and expect to do it faster. So it's like high level guys don't see perfect sight pictures on every shot. What they do is learn what they can get away with and then repeat it. So your thinking has to be more towards that. And um, uh, Hans six things like work on recoil control. That's, that's one way to do it. The other way um, you might want to look at it is if you see some times you can start with split times, whatever you want, but you look at times that you should be running at whatever it is, you could be close range target, like make it a build drill on a close target. Like you, you learn what the time needs to be and then force yourself to shoot that time and experience it and then go from there where it's like, okay, I'm shooting this speed at this target. Like, okay, I'm not hanging onto the gun hard enough because it's flipping all over the place. So I got to work on that. Or I'm seeing, I'm seeing the blur of the fiber on, on my sights like Ben's talking about, and that's cool. But now I'm shooting, a, all my hits are low in the target. And I mean, I think I'm pushing down into the recoil or I'm pushing you know, the trigger sideways or some kind of shit. So you, you have to force yourself to shoot the times that you want to shoot. You're going to see what goes wrong and then work on fixing it. And again, getting comfortable with aiming differently, where it's like blur of the fiber might be enough. Or shooting as soon as your sights come down out of recoil, like instantaneously, as opposed to sights come down out of recoil when you're shooting at a target. And then you kind of press the trigger slowly and carefully to ensure a hit. And then, you know, do, do that again. It, you have to like, okay, so the problem here is I can't press the trigger fast and straight. So I got to work on that thing. So those sort of stuff, you're going to have to change your technique around to get better and like learn to do you know, to, to get away with less, especially in terms of aiming or, or whatever else. Yep. That makes sense. Absolutely. Matt, Matt I'm yeah. sure you want to jump in. All I want to add is he's going to have to put in the work to get this to happen. It's not just going to happen with what he's been doing already. Yeah. And that, that's a good way of putting it. But it's like, it's like well, half of it's the work. And this guy seems like a dude who's willing to work. He's asking guy, the question. So he's halfway there already. Well, no, I just, his attitude, like guys like this are willing to work. But that's yeah, not mm-hmm. that's, that's not all of it. It's like I don't care so much about the time you're willing to put in, but it's like, are you willing to actually push and fuck up in, in order to get better? Right. Like I've got this friend of mine messaging me hard, like every day for the last week. Like he wants to know what drill do I do, what time should it be, and then you know how many rounds do I shoot it. That that's what he wants to know. And what I want to know from him is, what are you learning? What are you experiencing? Like you're, he writes down everything he does. He's writing down all these times and he's writing down the points he shoots. But it's like, that's not really telling me the information I want to know. You know what I mean? Like if he's right. shooting some drill, it's like, well, I, you, you have a number here for your, your time. And you, ha- you told me how many C's you shot on this drill. But that's not really telling me anything. It's like, where are they? Like what is happening? Why aren't you shooting more A's? Like, are you, you know, are they putting shots left? Are they going low? Like, what is happening here? Does that make sense, guys? Absolutely. Or is he has to change his thinking from, like, this is the result he wants to, like, what are you going to learn? How are you going to get there? How are you going to make this right. happen? Like, learning the process versus just being results-driven. Yeah. It's, it's something, it's something I kind of preach to guys all the time is learning how to, to focus on the process versus focusing on the results you want. Because the result will come with learning what the process is, and not just uh, you know a number or a score. Yeah, I mean, a good question to ask about a drill is not like what score should the, should I have, but what am I supposed to learn? What am I trying to master here? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. I have. So when I was really struggling to get out of B class, um, I was not able to do the benchmark skill uh, hype times, like one second draw, one second reload kind of thing. So and then I listened to this podcast, this podcast, Practical Business Show. It's episode five on YouTube. The title is Team Heron's Pot of Gold. You're and, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and in that episode, uh, Ben and Tim talked about, uh, in order to go fast, how you need to be relaxed. And then at the time, I was pretty tense, and I didn't have the physical skill to get out of B class. When I say physical skill, it means being able to draw it in one second, and also being able to index my side to the target kind of thing. And one of the biggest reason was I didn't know how to use my body to have that one second draw. So my body was pretty tense. I was trying to rip the gun out and like my body was doing it too strongly and I was like banging the gun when I draw kind of thing. So this guy may have that kind of challenge too. And I think a lot of uh, people in B class or A class they can get out of their, their classification, I believe, up to master class with merely skills. And then if you want to be a GM, I think you need to have the ability to perform. But before that, I think it's just about skills. So go listen to episode five, Practical Pizza Show, and then try to be relaxed. But learn how to be relaxed when you reload and draw, but learn how to tense up when you and actually fire it. So it's like guitar playing. When you play guitar, you cannot tense up the whole hand, left hand. You can you should only tense up your fingertips kind of thing. So you have to separate your muscles. And I think if you want to do reload fast, draw fast, but also be able to shoot really fast uh, fast splits with really strong grip, I think people should learn how to, you know, relax and tense up in in like Tens of seconds, less than tens of seconds. Uh, what I like to tell people is, you just hold the gun with your hands. Mm-hmm. So, yep. <laughs> if you're drawing or reloading, like you don't, you don't need to worry about mm-hmm. having your arms be super tense. But yes, okay, good. I mean, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, a lot of times, like for the B class people listening, I want to reiterate this. So one thing that I do quite commonly with uh, B class people is like you have them hold the gun and point it at the target. And then I do the trigger part mm-hmm. and I'll like point the point. They're going to the target. I, I just take, they're going to go blah, 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 blah. And they're like, Holy fuck. They can like hold it in the center of the target. And it's like, yeah, you could do that. Cause you're the guy holding the gun. I, the only thing I did is the trigger part. It's like, yeah, you can, I'm going to like, I'm going to make you shoot this fast. I did that actually with, um, a chick shooter a few years ago. She actually went on to win a world championship in her division, I should say, um, after this. But like she's she's holding the gun and I do the trigger part and it's like totally counter to their thinking. Like they, they have it in their brain, they can't shoot that fast. But if they hold the gun and they do the aiming and somebody else does the trigger part and they're still hitting in the center of the target, shooting way faster than they feel comfortable, then a lot of it just becomes, okay, that's how fast you're going to shoot. You're going to see what the sights are doing. You'll learn to aim that way. And then a big part of your training becomes acclimation, where you just become used to shooting that speed. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So that's my fucking take on it. I like it. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we, uh, that's all we have for today, isn't it? That was the last yeah. question, man. I That's the last so. question. It's so good. <laughs> Did you have fun, Hopkins? Yeah, it was a good time. Was it? Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming on. We're going to do it again next week. Awesome. Oh, my God. So good. Best podcast ever. <laughs>